I'm thrilled to be learning from you this morning. So happy to see you. Happy to see you too. So I'm going to be using two screens. So okay. can you see me all? You can see me, yeah. right? Yes. And you, and you can see my other screen. Great. Yes, we can see both. Oh, look at that. Amazing, you are good at right. this. Okay. Shabbat Shalom. Um, Yashra Koch to Rabbi James and Rabbi Kleinbaum and to all the Torah readers. It's been a, a beautiful Shabbat service so far. Um, so this week's Parsha pin, it opens with Pinchas, the grandson of Aaron, the priest, by whose name we call today's Parsha. And he's lionized for averting God's anger and for preventing God from wiping out the entire people by a plague. For this, he and his descendants merit a priesthood for all time. It's like the Torah has erected a statue in his honor. But like the controversial statues across the country, this Parsha opens with an erasure of the past. For at the end of last week's Parsha, Balak, the act Pinchas performed to bring a stop to divine plague, which had already taken 24,000 lives, was the public slaughter of an Israelite man who wanted to be in relationship with a Midianite woman. And after all, remember, Moses' first wife is a Midianite, so maybe what's so wrong with that? By dividing the Pinchas story over two weeks, it's as if the Torah reading cycle wants to obscure somewhat Pinchas's zealot, zealous and terrifying, terrifying past behavior. So in light of what's happening around us in the US, COVID-19, the protest to confront systemic racism, that full Pinchas story for me is just too hard to read on its surface level. If we had more time, I would offer a way to read this story as a warning about the dire consequences of, of a leadership vacuum. As much as the Torah wants us to learn from Moses's greatness, it also across the Torah wants us to learn from his great failings. And to unpack all of that, we would need a lot more time. And also it's Shabbat morning and I wanna try to be a little bit more hopeful, a little bit more forward thinking, and that's what we're gonna do today. So what I want to do this morning is I want us to become midrashists. And I want us to read one verse in the Parsha like the ancient rabbis would. I want us to liberate one verse from its immediate context and to creatively use a few words to inspire conversation and reflect on something of contemporary concern. At times, the midrash, the ancient midrash, will work with the storyline and context. But at other times, its moral imagination derives from believing that a divine text doesn't have to be read like a normal book. It can also be read symbolically. And that's what we're going to do this morning with all of your help. So we're going to skip over the Pinchas story and go to the end of chapter 25. Let's see if I get that. Uh, yes, end of chapter 25, verse 19 and the beginning of chapter 26, and the strange way the words are spaced out in the Torah scrolls and the Mesoretic editions of the printed Torah. So let's look at the text and we'll read it. So it says, now it was after the plague that Adonai said to Moshe and to Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saying, take up the head count of the entire, take up the head count of the entire community of the children of Israel, from the age of 20 years and upward, according to their father's house, everyone out to the armed forces in Israel. Everyone goes out to the armed forces of Israel. And if you notice, there's something weird going on in the, in the text is that at the end of 2519, there's a, an entire space left at the end of the line. Um, and that's just not usual. It's just not usual. And so what, what's going on here is that the Mas Masoretic text, the people who edited the Torah, um, told us that there's supposed to be a piska be'emsa pasuk, that there has to be a break in the text at this point. Um, and that's why we have this in line at the end of the verse, which is just very, very strange. Um, and we see, and so, and there's a break between, so the end of the plague, and then there's a break between the census taking. So that's what's going on here. But for the Midrash, a break is never just a break. A break's an opportunity to, cre to create creatively and sermonically fill in the blank. And that's what I thought we would do a little bit this morning. So when you hear the words, when the plague is over or the plague was over, how would you begin to sermonically fill in the space in light of your own or our own experience right now with COVID-19? 
what apprehensions and hopes, anxieties and promises are stirring up for you by this image of the bear being a time after that pandemic. So I invite, like, let's hear a few, a few thoughts about how you would fill in the blank for you, for all of us as a community. Um, and you can unmute yourselves, I guess, um, and jump in. I will also ask that um, if you can raise your hand, um, if you Great. can do it electronically, that's ideal. If you are not able to do it electronically, then wave and I will try my best to find you. And What's stirring for you about this plague, this pandemic being over? Stacy Harris. Can you Stacey. unmute yourself? I'm just looking forward to singing and being with people. <laughs> Great. That's, that's, that's it. And more than anything else, I just, you know, being able to actually hear the congregation thing. I'm not just talking about the choir. I'm talking about just everybody. Yes, of course. Thank you, Stacey. Somebody else. I see a hand raised, um, 914262, go right ahead. Hello, thank you, Rabbi James, it's Goldalee. Um, Hi, Goldalee. I am looking forward to seeing my wife in San Diego, who I've not seen for a year, and was supposed to go to see right before this all happened. So I'm all very grateful to God and you all for holding this space, which makes it almost painless. Come in. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've got uh, Joe Hirschman and then Jonathan Adler and Jeffrey Weiss. Great. Go ahead, Joe and Elizabeth. You can unmute yourselves. Hi, everyone. This is Joe. Um, Uvin, thank you so much. What a profound question. And um, I don't know if I, I don't, I don't know if it's over. And as I sit with that the blank space actually feels really, um, really perfect. And I think it reflects, um, I um, work in a hospital setting, I'm a chaplain, and I think it reflects some of the, for me, it, it resonates with the in-between space that it feels like we're in as we look back on something that was so painful and filled with so much loss. Um, and, uh, and it's not, I'm not sure yet what, what the next period of time will look like. And I think maybe as a parent also in this summer period between school being completely closed and we don't really know yet what's gonna happen in the, in the autumn, the blank space uh, feels really, um, um, uh, really fitting. And then I think the last thing I'll say is that something that I'd like to fill the blank space with is more like venturing outside, like um, slightly more adventurous trips, like a little bit further from home um, to New Jersey, a little bit deeper into Westchester. And I'm, I'm uh, welcoming the opportunity to do that. Thank, thanks, Joe. And we're, we're going to come back to your first observation, but thank you for that. Um, so let's just take two, two more. So Jonathan and Jeffrey, and then we're and then we're going to move on a little bit. I feel like the blank space is holding a space in the Torah for the stories of all the people who were lost in the plague, and what were their stories supposed to be before the plague took them away from us? Great, thank you. That's really very powerful. Thank you, Jeffrey. Okay, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. First, to get rid of that despot in Washington <laughs> and that we live in a world that, that, that hatred goes away because I feel like it, it's, there's a silver lining that we can all in this country get rid of racism and all can live together and make this a better world. That's what I'm just thinking. Thank, thank you, Jeffrey. So it's interesting how each of you touched on in some ways, like something that I think the commentators are gonna to touch on. So I'm gonna share with you two commentaries. Um, 
just for your, just for to like to think about, and then I'm gonna end with two different poems. So the first commentary is Rashi. Um, and in Rashi says, now is after the plague, a parable to a shepherd that wolves entered his flock and they killed some of them and he counts them to know the number remaining. Another explanation, when they left Egypt and were entrusted to Moses' care, they were entrusted to him by accounting. Now, when he is close to death and, his hand, and has to hand back his flock, he hands them back through accounting. So Rashi's linking, you know, using the silence to link the end of the plague to the census that's coming. And I would just say briefly, you know, Rashi, I think, is, is talking about the shortcomings of Moses as, uh, as a leader here or reflecting on them and taking that, that pause to do that. And I think he's like saying, like a shepherd in this parable, he didn't do enough to protect the people. And I think maybe he might even be asking the question, was Moses not empathetic enough to understand what the people were going through and allow them to stray and allow a, a wolf to, to move in on the flock? And I think the answer is yes. And I think also that it allowed Moses not to be a, a full protector of a people, you know, protector of his people, which... I think Mimi Jeffrey was alluding to about our president. And I think Rashi is saying maybe there's a little bit of yes. So I think, you know, from Rashi, I think we can reflect a little bit on what's going on in the contemporary situation by filling in the blank. And then the next commentary comes from another 11th century commentator, but this one from Spain, a guy named Ibn Ezra. And Ibn Ezra says, and what's the reason for the break in the verse? After the plague, because of this, God said to them, divide up the land. So what Ibn Ezra is doing here is that he's saying that the cessation of the plague is a pause in the text to call our attention to a new beginning that's going to happen for the people. And for Ibn Ezra, it's now time to move on to the next phase in their journey across the wilderness to divide up the land and get it ready for settlement. And like for us, you know, I want to ask the question, you know, is this pandemic forcing us into the kind of new thinking we need to move forward and not to keep repeating the failures of the past? And while this wasn't Ibn Ezra's intention when he brought up the division of the land, and maybe this was something that, you know, Jonathan might resonate with, COVID-19 is creating a space in the U.S. for talking about the discriminatory access to goods and services across our country. And could the end of the pandemic for us result in more just and equitable redistribution. So I'm taking off on, on Ibn Ezra's lechalek to distribute the land and you thinking where my mind is going about redistribution that's so much needed in our, in our country today. So I wanna end with, with two poems. Um, and I goes back to something that Joe said about, you know, there's also a time for having some silence. And there's these two poets um, are talking about the need for silence. And the first poem is from Rachel. So silence means not filling in the blank right now. And these two poets talk about the importance of silence. So the first poet is Rachel. She was an early Zionist poet who died at, in 1930 at the age of 41 from tuberculosis. And I've been going back to her a lot during this pandemic because her poetry is a lot about suffering from illness and the loneliness associated with that. And then the, the final poem is from a contemporary living poet. Her name is Adi Kesar. And unfortunately, she's not translated into English yet, but she's amazing. And I hope, God willing, she'll be translated soon. Her poetry and activism is, are redrawing the lines in Israeli society to create space for inclusion and justice across difference. So both of these poets, I think, speak really well to the time we're living in. So the first poem, it's called, I Have Recalled. I have recalled more than once recalled the sick heart galloping like a startled horse, everything in the light of a full moon, pale and unreal. And in the silence, suddenly a hint of fire that reminds and brings tidings, makes thirsty and satisfies, satisfies wounds and heals. So that wow, that's me for spectacular. A that is and then, yeah, and then I love Rachel, but I'm not familiar with that. That is spectacular. It's, yeah, she, it's amazing. Her poetry amazing. for this time period is just like just hits the spot. Um, and then the last poem is called On a couple of our CBST trips. We've gone to her grave. Oh, nice. Um, and the last poem is from Adi Kesar, who's a living poet. She's 40 years old, comes from a Yemenite background. 
And really she's an activist and a poet who's really trying to you know, build bridges across difference, bring out voices that haven't been heard before. And she, she's amazing and she's also become a friend. The right to be silent. People use lofty words like precious jewelry, which adorn the tongue, using short words like body movements in order to feel the skin scratch, stretch with words cutting switch, switch blades. In order to feel, they forget that even in a silent mouth, there are teeth grinding the clear mountain air and jaws await people who say, look, how the heavens are beautiful today, don't understand that also tomorrow, the one who is silent is God. Oh, wow. Wow. So, you know, if there are any, just a few, if there's anyone wants to react either to the poems or to the comments, maybe we have a little bit of time to do that. Sure, we have a couple of minutes. Stacy, I see your hand up. Um, the last poem that you read, uh, uh, Vane. Yeah. It, um, I sort of interpret it as, is God silent in this pandemic? Yeah. So it, and then what does that mean? Like, what does God's silence mean? Is it yeah. leaving space for us? you know, to, to fill in our voices or what, or is it something else? Is it something more, more profound about that we're doing something wrong? I don't know. It's, it's, it, 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 I'm sorry. I didn't mean no, to No, yeah, go ahead, Stacey. It, it, now that you said that, cause I tend to go towards the negative instead of the positive. Um, but I, I do find that um, a, a, a friend of mine, uh, I'm gonna mention uh, Taff Randy, always kind of looks for that positive that you can, you know, God is there, but we need to do. So I think, I mean, that's my interpretation of what we talked about. So, yeah. So well, I'm going to look at it as that. Thank you, Stacy. That was, that's really powerful. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Marissa. I'm, I'm going to raise my hand. Um, Stacy, what you were just saying maybe was making me think um, how almost all of us are either having the experience in these last few months of having a lot more silence than we're used to or a lot less. And if we're seeking God in silence, you know, if, if kind of being with silence is, is one of, I think about the silent Amida and like where are those moments where we're given the gift of ritual to connect and it really often has to do with silent moments. What does it mean if silence has started to feel like a burden because there's so much of it? Or what does it mean if silence feels almost inaccessible um, because we're constantly with, with others, even if we love them? Um, so that, that kind of tension is something I'm now thinking about. Right, thank you. I think one of the things that struck me about this is that we don't know when the phrase after the plague will be, right. will be relevant for us. And I think that's part of the anxiety we're all feeling that that and and the idea that there will be a time after the plague is so tantalizing um but we don't i i certainly feel like we can't i can't yet settle into that because of obviously the obvious reasons so uh i look forward to exploring what the after the plague feels like one of the things i've been very moved in the study of psalms in our class and i know some folks here have been studying psalms is one of the one of the Jewish concepts is sometimes we feel God's presence and sometimes we feel God's absence, but God's there for both, so to speak. But we experience God in the universe very differently. Sometimes God's absence, and that that's how I relate to that piece of silence is that experience of God's absence. Yeah, and I think like that that break in the text, like can, yeah, we can fill it in with waiting and anticipation. We don't yeah. have to move forward with it. I think that's true. And yeah. I think, you know, I think Rachel's poem about the silence that there's a hint of fire and fire has both positive and negative, you know, yeah. has a negative symbolism. Absolutely. And like, that's where we're in now. We see positive and negative. And yeah. that's like, that's where we're wrestling with. And it's a little bit of the 17th of Tamu's sense of the breach of the walls, which I've been thinking a lot about, which is that feeling of impending doom, not quite at the doom, but here we are in this moment of we've experienced a lot of doom these last couple of years and now in this plague doom. And is this a moment where we are turning a corner towards things getting better 
Or is this a moment where we have to anticipate things are going to continue? We're going to have to continue with living in a moment of doom. We don't really know. Mm -hmm. We do not know. And so that silence is very profound to me. So thank yeah. you. For that. It's a beautiful thank you so much, everybody. This was a great, a great session of creating our own midrash and, our yes. own, and being able to express our own apprehensions and hopes. And um, it was beneficial for me. So beautiful. thank you all. I hope you know, it's beneficial Ruben, maybe, for you all. Maybe in the fall or we'll, we, you should teach some Israeli poetry at CBS. Oh. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Ruvain, he is an incredible interpreter of Israeli poetry, both of the earlier part of the 20th century with like Rachel, but also he's really connected to what's happening now in Israel. Um, so let's talk about that. Uh, that'd be wonderful to have a Zoom class yeah. uh, on Israeli poetry. I'll be the first to sign up. Thank you. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom, everybody.